Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today as we celebrate the Feast of the Holy New Martyrs and Confessors of Russia, it's a day that, of course, I chose for us to serve that we had an option with St. Ignatius or that. But I believe that it's vital that we serve the New Martyrs and Confessors of Russia. They are so near to our own time. Most of us in this room lived in a time when this was going on. Some of us in this room lived where it was going on. Many have had relatives who were new martyrs and confessors of Russia. My ordaining bishop one time, I asked him about his, uh, his grandfather, who he was named after actually, was a new martyr of Russia. I asked him about that, of course, he said, it's really not a big thing. He said, everybody in Russia has relatives, or at least know people that probably were martyrs in Russia. There were tens of millions of people killed. Conservative estimates have 40 million. Perhaps more. We don't know how many people are in the graves. Hundreds of bishops, thousands upon thousands of priests, tens of thousands of monks and nuns, millions of lay people. Of course, there are people killed there for other reasons as well. Stalin, in particular, made you know, no bones about killing anybody he felt like killing. Anybody he felt paranoid of died, which was virtually most people. But these new martyrs, very much like Zacchaeus, were filled with desire. And filled with desire for God. You look at the life of St. Tikhon of Moscow, of course, who labored in America. He had to make important decisions toward God every day. What was essential to maintaining the faith in Russia and what could they perhaps give a little leeway on because everybody was getting killed and he had to make hard, hard decisions. But yet he did not back down to the government. In fact, he anathematized the communist authorities for what they were doing. St. Benjamin of Petrograd, when they would send the people of the living church to his, to his church, he would let them speak. He would send up the deacon to pronounce the anathema because indeed there were heretics who renounced Christ, not just innovators, not just pro-communists, absolute heretics. And all of these people had to make decisions every day, laity amongst them, every day, whether they would serve Christ or not, what was most important in their lives. You look at the efforts they made to go to church and let nothing get in the way. We let comfort get in the way. They would not let death get in the way. And if the churches were shut down, which most of them were, the vast majority of them were shut down, they were turned into garbage dumps, they were turned into dance halls, they were turned into bars, anything you could think of were pretty much demolished. And if they couldn't worship in the few churches that were available, they worshiped in their homes, they worshiped in the woods, in catacombs, wherever they could find. You read these wonderful stories in some of the death camps of certain bishops and priests who knew the services by heart, chanting Pascal, the Paschal Canon by heart in the woods. A beautiful thing. And ministering to each other and making decisions daily for Christ. That's precisely what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus was not a well-liked man. We hear the word public, it doesn't quite hit us the way it does them. Of course, we think of IRS, and a lot of us don't like the IRS. We've all had our experiences with the IRS and probably unpleasant. It's a bit different thing. These men who are the chief public, and especially him, made a decision to become that. They weren't always appointed that. Who could bribe the government the most got the job. So he bribed a great deal to get into this position because he knew he could make money off of it. And to make up that money that he had to pay for the position, he imposed great burdens on the people, things that were well beyond what they were supposed to be taxed. But nobody asked as long as the money was coming in. So he had a great deal of harmful influence on the people that were around him. But there was something still good in his heart, some remnant of good, despite the fact that he was hated. So he has Jesus of Nazareth coming to town. He has heard things. The previous passages that we heard last week this blind man was healed. Before that, ten lepers were healed. And he's probably hearing through the grapevine now the marvelous works of this Jesus of Nazareth. And he's interested in seeing what this is, who this is. And of course, he's very short of stature, so not only is he the publican, but he's probably made fun of for his height as well. But that makes no difference to him. He climbs the tree in front of everybody, you can imagine he probably looked quite awkward, this little guy climbing this tree, struggling to get up it to see Jesus because he couldn't see over the crowd. And that and the fact that he was so hated, you can imagine there was a tad of ridicule going on. He was not loved. 
probably a lot of ridicule. The one opportunity they could pick on the man. Yet he didn't mind. And he's up in this tree, here comes Christ. And Christ sees him up in this tree and calls him down. Knows him by name, he never met him. Zacchaeus. He has a name before God. Come down, today I must abide in your house. He scampers down this tree. I imagine he's still getting mocked. He's coming down this tree. That's probably more awkward. Coming down is more difficult than getting up quite often. And when he comes down, he's so elated, he looks at the Lord and says, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and whatever I've taken falsely, I restore fourfold. And this is amazing. Imagine giving half we had away and our repentance. And the thing, people we had wronged, suppose that we had taken a thousand dollars from someone and all of a sudden we have to say, okay, I'm giving you back four thousand dollars. That is what he is saying. It is a remarkable amount of repentance. And salvation came to that house that day, he is told, because of the heart, the goodness of his heart. He turned from his old ways as I've said with Mark the ascetic, we don't go to hell for sinning, we go to hell for not repenting. Zacchaeus repented. He changed his way of life and turned toward Christ. And he was invited into his home. Many of you have had Christ come into your homes with house blessings. Many of you have invited him in many other ways. And indeed, with our baptism, he is in our homes. Would our home be a fit place for him? Now, I know how often people hesitate to have the priest come to their house because they're mortified at what it's going to look like. What was one of the families in here who's not here today told me the other day when they had boxes, I bet everybody says this to you, excuse the mess. Well, some do, some don't. And they still wanted Christ in their house. But when we invited Christ into our house, we'd be ashamed of anything that he saw, not just the mess. Would there be things on the television we didn't want him to see? Would there be things on the radio? Would there be music? Would there be magazines? Would there be books? What would there be that would mortify us that Christ saw? And beyond that, far more beyond the outward things, Christ comes to dwell in our hearts. He doesn't fit in an impure vessel very well. There's only room for Christ in the heart. There's not room for idols. Would he find things in the heart where there was anger Lust, gluttony, avarice, sloth. Would you find those things in the heart? There's no room for it without repentance. We have to turn away from those things and turn to Christ and offer up the half of our goods to the poor and restore fourfold with our repentance. And all of us every day come to this place with Christ where Christ sees us sitting up in a tree every day in our shame. And he stands at this crossroads in front of us, all of a sudden he steps into the way. And there may be something good over there behind him. Perhaps it's something okay to do, not necessarily illicit or sinful. He stands in front of us and says, now choose. Do you choose that or do you choose me? Do you make that your idol or do you choose me as your God? And that is the decision Zacchaeus had to make. Do I want to continue this position of power and have tremendous amounts of money and influence, still being hated, but not caring because I was living sumptuously the way I wanted? Or do I turn to Christ? Many others have had this decision. There's the rich fool who built up his barns. He had a decision to give this to fill up the bellies of the poor, as John Chrysostom and Gregory Palamas say, and make them the barns, or to turn to Christ. He chose the other path. <coughs> we have the rich young ruler who fulfilled the commandments, was told to give all away that he had. He chose his goods, his money. We have the rich man in Lazarus, who saw Lazarus out there every day, but chose to live that way in this life. And each of us every day, and not just because of money, but for all the issues that keep us back from God, have Christ walk into the path again and say, choose. Will you choose the football game tonight or will you choose me? 
Will you choose that extra alcohol or will you choose me? Will you choose to watch that hideous thing on the television which no Christian has a business watching or me? Will you choose to be hateful and angry towards your neighbor continually or choose me? Will you choose to stay away from church and bow down to the communist authorities or choose me? Will you choose to stay away from church because you don't like somebody there or will you choose me? Will you choose to be hateful to people at work and gossip like everyone else or choose me? He's standing by, there, by the water cooler with you. Will we gossip because <clears throat> he's standing there or do you choose me? Will you choose to constantly bash and slander everybody else in the world while he's standing there saying, they're my children, choose me. Be a Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, as we begin this five-week preparation period before Lent, stands there showing us desire. Not a sinful desire, but an ordered desire. A desire that is ordered that God gave us toward him, to seek union with him, to seek his love, to seek his embrace, to seek his kingdom, to have that fervent desire, as the new martyrs and confessors of Russia did, as Father Seraphim Rose said, they should serve as a guidebook for us because it is what is coming here. Perhaps not immediately, that our deacon and others could have a good conversation with you about the similarities of the culture before the revolution and the similarities of our culture now, which is hardly a godly culture. Which Christians, as you may have seen the last few weeks, I heard people tell me about it, that this so-called women's march, when you had blasphemous things, warning Christ dead on signs, and blaspheming his mother. Is this a society that is Christian? Hardly. We have to be prepared. What is our desire? Is that a desire for Christ, or worldly comfort and power? Choose Christ, as Zacchaeus did, and as the new martyrs of Russia did. Amen. Amen.